uh, at Columbia University at the Menbrick Labs under the supervision of Dr. Menley. You can also see my contact information on the first slide. So feel free to email me or contact me on Twitter if you have any questions. And throughout this presentation, if you have a question or something that's very interesting or you want me to clarify anything, the best is if you unmute yourself. I will pause to take the question and then we will go on. I'll also try to like pause at times. If you feel shy or can't have your mic on, just type it in and I'll try to take them also as they come. And then at the end, we will have a little discussion, I hope. Um, so with that, with that, in background, I will um, start uh, by giving you the outline of today's presentation. So today I will be presenting work from my doctoral dissertation that I have done at Karolinska Institute. And my main focus is social epidemiology. Uh, but I also have an interdisciplinary background uh, in anthropology. So I have both qualitative and quantitative methods background. And uh, today we will speak about um, different Swedish school reforms and how we have leveraged those as a natural and quasi experiments. And I will present two different studies, um, one focusing on uh, intelligence and emotional outcomes in late adolescence and the second one on dementia. Uh, I um, and the thesis is fully available in case you want to look at it later and one of the studies has been published so I can also share my slides later. So with that I would just like to set up the general framework for what we're talking about and I know you probably know this uh, but uh, there is a lot happening throughout the entire lifespan and we are born with certain abilities or predispositions and throughout our life, there are many different factors that might influence the cognitive ability and as well as their trajectories of the cognitive abilities from early life to midlife or midlife or early midlife when the cognitive abilities peak to late life. So there is a lot happening. And I was specifically focusing during my entire dissertation only on education, which is relatively in, uh, in a narrow period in early life or from six to 18 more or less for a lot of people and just to bring the point home why I think it's really important to focus on education uh, it is because uh, there has been a lot of evidence that uh, education does affect different health outcomes and even causally affects different health outcomes and it also is a population-based intervention, or that is the way I'm thinking about it. It is a general exposure that even if the effects are relatively small, they affect everyone in the population. And by that, we can really change a lot about the health of our populations. And another thing is that it is a modifiable factor. During the 20th century, there have been huge increases in the length of education globally, and currently, uh, education is still rising a lot in the developing countries of the world and we're hoping that this will bring about a positive change in the world. So we have succeeded to intervene on the length of education, which makes it a good tool for our societies. Um, so in today's presentation, within this framework, we will focus on two separate parts, as I have already mentioned. And uh, the first one is we will be focusing on the early life cognitive ability in the study one. And I just want to point out that the illustrations uh, come from the thesis and I have done all of them and they will be guiding you through the whole presentation. So if you see the orange uh, tree, that means uh, that we are focusing on the early life in case you got a little lost. And then if you're seeing the another illustration, it will be dementia. Um, so in this specific study, we have asked a question if there is a causal effect of education on intelligence in late adolescence. But we also had a secondary question because there has been already fewer studies looking at causal effects of education on intelligence. But we wanted to take it further and look at uh, the heterogeneity of such an effect. And we have looked if such an effect could vary uh, for people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So these are the two main questions here. And in the second study, we focus on a late life uh, cognitive ability. And here we have only one research question and we're uh, asking if there is a direct causal effect of education on the risk of old age dementia. Uh, 
and I will speak uh, later about the word direct a lot more and what I mean by that. So now with this general, very brief introduction in mind, I will give you also a little primer on uh, the different aspects of cognition throughout our life. And those of you who do cognitive aging will be very familiar with this. But uh, here is a uh, schematic of cognitive performance somewhere through adult life to old age. And we can see that the two black lines are individuals that start at different level but decline at the same rate. And the yellow line signifies some form of uh, functional impairment threshold, such as dementia diagnosis. And even though the individuals start at the same uh, decline at the same rate, they reach the threshold at different time, as you can see here. Uh, for example, the first individual around age maybe 73, and the second individual at age 85, which is a huge difference uh, in practical terms and costs to healthcare. There's another aspect that we often speak about in cognitive aging, and that is the dashed comparison between the uh, dashed line and the black line. And that would be a comparison between individuals who start at the same level, but start declining at a different rate. And even if they started at the same point, they again reach the threshold of cognitive impairment or dementia at different times. Again, this is a huge simplification um, and a schematic. In reality, there probably could be uh, factors that affect both uh, the level and rate of decline. And uh, some factors might play more role for the rate and other factors for decline. With regards to education, according to recent meta-analysis that uh, my group and I have been doing, uh, education acts mainly through difference in affecting the level uh, of abilities. Uh, and that sort of makes sense because education will increase hopefully your abilities in early life and then you decline throughout your life. There are also, just wanted to point out that different cognitive abilities, uh, such as fluid reasoning or crystallized abilities that you see on those two graphs, have slightly different trajectories throughout the life. Um, so they, uh, there is a period of rapid increase during the early life, and then at some point, individuals on average reach a peak and start declining. Uh, in the yellow box, I highlighted the early uh, life, not the early life period, but the period up to the peak. Uh, but you can also see that the education time is still at the high intensity increase. So there is already an ongoing increase and we would hope that we can magnify that by educational interventions or education itself. And of course, our uh, cognitive abilities or uh, inherited cognitive ability will influence our uh, propensity and behavior in the educational system and also later life cognitive ability. So there is a bi-directional relationship um, between these aspects. Uh, so that complicates our estimation of a causal effect because inherited cognitive abilities will influence both education and outcomes. So they will confound these associations as I signify by the red lines here. And what we really want to do in estimating causal effects, as you all know, is to get rid of those lines and isolate the relationship between the education and our outcome of interest. One way to do this, um, and I know your group has a lot of background in this, is through using quasi-natural, uh, quasi-experiments or natural experiments, which introduce pseudo-randomization. Um, and uh, one example of such uh, uh, experiments is uh, compulsory schooling reform. And this is what I have been focusing on in my thesis. So now I will go to give you the background of the two Swedish reforms that we will be talking about. And I wanted to compare and contrast them as we go uh, because they have different characteristics. So one important aspect, as you can see in both of those figures, is that they, were, they both introduced spatial and temporal variation, which is independent of the individual. 
And that is what it really allows us to, to use this as a quasi or natural experiment. On the left, you see a comprehensive schooling reform, which we use in the study on intelligence in late adolescence. And the graph shows for which birth cohorts uh, and what municipalities in Sweden the reform was introduced. And you can see that this looks very, very structured. And that is because educational researchers have actually designed this reform uh, to have uh, control, uh, control municipalities that were kept uh, without introducing the reform and intervention municipalities. Uh, the, uh, the controls and intervention municipalities were selected based on their school characteristics, socioeconomic background, uh, student body composition. So the municipalities uh, submitted information to the educational board and the educational board decided which, which school uh, district or municipality can start implementing this reform. And it was because as the name implies, comprehensive school reform introduced a lot of changes to the Swedish educational system. And the Board of Education wanted to be really sure that, uh, that these changes actually are helpful and structured in a good way for the students and reach the goals. Uh, the other reform, the primary schooling reform, you can see also a map of Sweden and the unit here, it, uh, the geographical units are actually school districts, which roughly correspond to church parishes. And there's about two and a half thousand of them. And there is some variation in which school districts have implemented this other reform, uh, but it is uh, less structured. And this has been, um, this reform has been uh, voluntary adoption prior to 19. 53. So all schools had, uh, school districts had to adopt it, but prior to certain timing. Hence, uh, the timing is not completely random or as uh, designed as in the first reform. But uh, once you control for um, the characteristics of the regions, um, uh, you do reach pseudo randomization. So, what did these reforms do? This is how the school system in Sweden looked prior to the 1936, before the primary schooling reform has been established. And uh, the compulsory education was uh, six years um, and individuals entered at age six um, to primary schooling, which uh, in Swedish is called folkskola. Uh, and if I use this term, this is what I mean. It's a primary schooling and it's one type of schooling. However, there was also presence of tracking based on ability. So at, uh, after third grade, children could do tests and enter um, so-called real school, where they would complete the rest of their primary schooling as signified here. And so some individuals would exit the primary schooling form and go to more academic track uh, continuation. And you could also go to the uh, high school, real school after primary schooling and continue further on. It is only the children who have attended the real school academic track that were uh, that qualified for higher education. About 70% of the population, uh, which is roughly signified by the width of the box, attended only the primary schooling in the folk school and about 30% have exited to real school after third grade. So this is how the system looked. And this is what this primary schooling reform did. It very simply added the blue box. It added a seventh grade for the individuals who were in the folk school primary education system. Uh, so for those people, as said, about 70% of the Swedish population, the student population, um, uh, one year increase of education has occurred in this schooling reform. In contrast, the comprehensive schooling reform has as its starting oh, point. Yeah. Yes, there's a question. Just on, uh, yeah, Neil here. Um, so, could you just summarize what the continuation school? So, 
just on this figure this is showing it's just one additional year otherwise they would have left school at age yes so continuation school is actually more like a summer school so in even though it's technically uh, says two years it amounted to three months of a summer school and it was to complete some uh, knowledge in order to start working. I realized after I have written my thesis and done this that this is very confusing to people, but it is not uh, really a full time education in the same format. So they would do like a week per uh, quarter of education for two years. Um, so that's what the continuation school is. So really the like formal schooling and compulsory schooling is only uh, the primary schooling time in the folk school. Does that make sense? Clarify yeah, your question. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's just, so grade seven in Sweden is age 12, 13, is that? 13, yes. Okay. At age 13. So it's going uh, at age 13. Mm -hmm. And this formal schooling that's being introduced is um, a conventional curriculum, an academic mm -hmm. curriculum yes. rather than a So it is a conventional curriculum. So basically the reasoning behind this reform, uh, my apologies for not uh, saying that, uh, has been that um, the curriculum has expanded over time and the students were not able to cover it in the six years. Um, so the Board of Education has decided that seventh year is needed in order to cover the same curriculum. So that's why the year has been added. There were no changes in the curriculum. There were no additional changes uh, to the school system. It really just provided more time to cover the previously outlined topics. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Um, so the comprehensive schooling reform uh, starts has its starting point the school system after the uh, folk school primary schooling reform so uh, the compulsory education at this point is seven to eight years depending uh, slightly because some school, school regions have increased it to eight but I will not get into the details of that um, and this is what the school reform did it replaced the entire um, lower system of education and unified it. So basically at this point, after the comprehensive schooling reform, all students stay together in some, uh, in the same format in primary and lower secondary schooling. Uh, tracking is abolished to the real schooler, so nobody exits based on ability. And everyone who completes the primary schooling is now eligible for upper secondary schooling. This reform also came with some changes to the curriculum, introduction of uh, English or higher emphasis on English. Some regions already studied English previously and uh, some expansion of certain uh, areas in the curriculum. So this was really a huge change to the educational system. And that is why the Board of uh, Education wanted it to be evaluated as it was rolled out. So to summarize more of the characteristics and who these reforms affect. Um, so the primary schooling reform, it's uh, prolonged education by one year from six to seven years. And the comprehensive schooling reform also prolonged education by one year from eight to nine. But even when we are talking about reforms that prolong education by one year, the timing of such an intervention, it differs. So, in the first case, uh, we are focusing on children at age 13 versus age 15. They also differ in who they affected uh, because the comprehensive schooling reform affected everyone who was at a, in school at a time in some way and the effects might be different uh, depending if you would have previously exited to an academic track or remained in the non-academic track. While the primary schooling reform affected only those uh, in one specific type of schooling, about 70% of the population. As I have already mentioned, uh, the first reform has not changed tracking and segregation of students, hence there was no uh, change in class composition or curriculum. And it also had minimal impact on uh, qualifying for further education. And from our analyses, there was also very narrow impact on that one year prolonging. Uh, while the second reform 
uh, change abolished tracking and hence changed class composition. It brought out some changes in the curriculum and it also made more individuals eligible for further education and more people indeed did continue to further education. So there is a possibility of lifelong impacts on trajectories while the first reform is a lot more narrow. And why I wanted to compare and contrast these reforms is because one of my big interests and uh, a place where I think we need to start focusing our attention more is on mechanisms and the possible pathways when we talk about causal effects. Um, and here you can see that, for example, even if we focus on one aspect of these reforms, such as prolonged education, there are many direct and indirect pathways. So for example, prolonged education can, we can hypothesize that it acts through uh, engage co uh, longer cognitive engagement and this prolonged cognitive stimulation is what increases the cognitive abilities and that, that's how it affects dementia or our other cognitive outcomes. Um, but there is also indirect pathways which are in the dashed lines. And uh, so for example, prolonged education could lead to adult cognitive stimulation or to higher educational achievement or midlife jobs. And this is later on, this is why I talk about the first reform as acting directly because it has not affected uh, access to higher education and uh, actual higher educational attainment and neither it has affected uh, much the midlife jobs. So really our hypothesis mechanism there is through from prolonged education to dementia incidents. While the other reform affected uh, more of those aspects, both the direct and indirect pathways in this case, and hence uh, it's harder to isolate the specific mechanism. And that could be both strength and a weakness of both of them. And I think it's really in the triangulation of uh, different types of reforms and interventions when we can gain a lot of knowledge in this area. So this concludes my uh, general background uh, on the Swedish educational reforms. Uh, are there any more questions at this point? Okay, I will pause for a little more, but uh, if there are no questions, I don't see any questions in the chat either, I will move on to, summer, uh, to presenting the first study. So in this first study, just to remind you, we're looking at a causal effect of education on intelligence and also non-cognitive skills in late adolescence. And we wanted to examine uh, heterogeneity of effects by socioeconomic background. Uh, this is the reform we were, uh, just to refresh, it is the reform that came with many changes, the comprehensive schooling reform, which came later in time, and uh, that we're talking about here. And our main outcome is intelligence. It was assessed at military conscription. So unfortunately, in this study, we were able to look only at uh, men and um, at military conscription to which pretty much all Swedish men went um, uh, to conscript even if they did not enroll in the army. So around age 18 all Swedish men are called in to the testing offices and they do cognitive tests as well as assessment by a psychologist. And here we have selected four uh, Four of the tests, um, and the first one is instruction, which includes 40 items, and it was testing uh, inductive logic as well as verbal ability. And it included sets of instructions, such as strike the fourth number, circle around the fifth letter of the alphabet in the list below, and the individuals were supposed to do those tasks. Um, and then were rated on correctness. There was also a concept discrimination test in which uh, the uh, subjects were supposed to select one out of five words that did not belong in the context. Uh, another ability that the, uh, that, uh, they were, uh, that the military conscription uh, tested was uh, visuospatial ability using the paper form board, uh, which is a variation of a Minnesota paper form board. And uh, 
uh, the men had to pick out one uh, out of four pieces that could form a given figure. So it's really 3D, 2D thinking ability. And the last one was more of a attained crystallized ability uh, test, uh, testing mainly technical comprehension. So uh, it illustrated different problems and um, the uh, men had to pick the correct solution, but there are also components of visuospatial ability. Because a lot of these tests engage more than one cognitive domain, we have decided that it is not easy to be able to separate them into, let's say, crystallized and fluid abilities, which is what I have presented earlier. Uh, and we have decided to create a latent IQ variable or ability variable, uh, which was uh, standardized to have mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. And we use structural equation modeling with uh, one latent factor and that model fitted well. Uh, so in addition to that, we also used emotional control variable as our secondary outcome. And emotional control in this case comes from interviews by psychologists. And uh, the army was interested in identifying individuals who uh, would make good officers and was interested in identifying people who had high control of situations, could re uh, keep calm demeanor and had high uh, stress tolerance, low anxiety. So this was a semi-structured interview by a psychologist and we had the ratings on that. Um, and we use this variable as a comparison uh, of the difference between intelligence as a cognitive ability and a softer non-cognitive ability in our outcomes. Our sample in this study uh, included eight full birth cohorts of Swedish uh, men born between 1951 and 1958. And these men uh, came from uh, around 1,000 municipalities. And our main exposure is the comprehensive schooling reform, which we assigned via municipality of residents uh, using census data. And uh, we used two different census uh, data sets, 1960 census for the earlier uh, birth cohorts and 1965 um, uh, uh, census for the later cohorts. And we have done this because uh, these census data best capture uh, the time uh, they are at the timing of schooling and hence uh, we really know where the individuals were living at the time of school when this reform was rolled out. Uh, our design uh, is quasi-experiment thanks to the reform that is uh, uh, introducing pseudo-randomization and for some reforms if you remember the earlier figure of the introduction there has been the reform has always been present for these birth cohorts. So we do not have a pre-measurement, but in sensitivity analyses, we have included owner municipalities that included uh, pre and post. And there is also a question that came up, uh, which was uh, for me to clarify why we were not looking at tested capture more fluid versus crystallized IQ domains separately. Yes, and that is a good question, and that is because the tests could not be easily separated into those, uh, because most of the uh, tests in the, uh, in the military conscriptions have engaged both crystallized and fluid abilities. For example, the last one on technical comprehension, that by content, that would be more of a crystallized ability because it tests our world knowledge and what you know from school and problem solving, but problem solving also includes components of processing speed and uh, some of the uh, problems had illustrations. So at that point you have visual spatial ability. So since each of the tests engage many domains and does not have a good psychometric properties for only singular domain assessment, that's why we have not done this. Um, if there is a follow-up question, either type it up or uh, write in the chat again. Our main modeling approach in this study has been uh, using multi-level uh, multi linear regressions. And um, the second level is the municipalities. Uh, so we're modeling um, 
the effect within municipalities and also cluster our uh, standard uh, errors uh, at the municipal, municipal level because that's the level of our exposure. And for the heterogeneous effects, we used parental socioeconomic position from the two census uh, data sources, and we used the highest one if mothers or fathers has differed. Um, so now, to first we of course need to establish if the reform in our sample has affected the length of education. And I have not mentioned this uh, before, but this specific reform, the comprehensive schooling reform has been studied extensively in Swedish literature. So this is more of a sanity check. But even in our sample, we replicate what has been done before and uh, the reform exposure did increase education by half a year on average uh, for everyone in our data set. And even here, we don't looked at the differential increase across parental socioeconomic position. And you can see that for uh, those who are at um, more of the lower end, lower skill level, uh, parental socioeconomic positions uh, coming from those backgrounds, the effect was higher. And for um, children or for example, non-manual workers and professionals, the gain in education was the lowest. And this makes sense if you would think of the system prior to this reform, because these, uh, in a sense of uh, higher non-manual workers or professionals, would have attended the extra schooling on average uh, anyways, because they would have uh, probably been encouraged to continue education and do the cognitive testing to go to the academic track Real Schooler and Real Schooler included already the ninth year of education and they would have continued on to further education. However, this also shows that even for some individuals in uh, those groups, they were still gates. Um, so uh, with that, we can move to our first sets of results and here you can see the average effect of the uh, reform on on intelligence and for all of our participants um, the reform has increased uh, intelligence by about 0.7 IQ points and if you rescale that the education increase was on average 0.5 uh, so it corresponds about 1.5 IQ points per year of education. And again, looking at the heterogeneous effect by parental socioeconomic background, here we're looking at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum and sons of farmers and qualified manual workers and qualified manual workers have gained the most. And this is where the gains of the reform have really uh, played a role. However, for the rest, uh, the reform uh, effects were not significant. So we can see that it is the reform is lifting education for those at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. With regards to emotional control, the average effect of um, the reform was actually negative. So there has been a decrease in emotional control uh, uh, following the reform introduction. And the effects were on average not significant, but um, you can see that uh, the magnitude was bigger, uh, especially for the high non-manual workers and professionals. So here our hypothesis was that this might have to do uh, a lot with the transitions in the schooling system and also changes in the class composition. Furthermore, the emotional control results did not survive the pre-post um, analyses, so uh, they are weaker in their strength. But we believe that this is an interesting point to bring up that reforms can have both positive and negative effects depending on, out, uh, on the outcomes you look at. And previous study, uh, several studies uh, are currently also showing that certain reforms, for example, in France or even in UK, had negative effects on mental health, which might uh, be emotional control might be a precursor for. To summarize and interpret the findings, uh, this specific Swedish comprehensive school reform 
uh, prolonged education by one year at age 15, which is a late adolescence, and still increased intelligence. So this is pointing to the fact that intelligence or cognitive abilities are malleable even at a later adolescence, not just in early life, which often has been debated. And further, the reform has uh, differed by socioeconomic background. So this shows really the potential for educational reforms to reduce socioeconomic inequalities in abilities in the society. And this reform agrees very well with a meta-analysis, uh, and it is included in this meta-analysis uh, of uh, quasi-experimental studies that did show that um, Intel, uh, that uh, education does improve intelligence and on average by one to five IQ points uh, for every additional year of education. So this reform was at the lower end of the spectrum, but really agrees with uh, these findings. So now I will uh, turn my attention to the second study, which looks at the later life cognitive abilities or more specifically, uh, a terminal decline in our cognitive abilities in the form of dementia. And uh, a lot of people have observed that ob in observational settings, education is associated with dementia and this specific meta-analysis uh, that I'm showing here showed that dementia risk decreased by 7% for every year increase in education. Um, and as we already said, uh, that though is not uh, making certain that um, that association isn't confounded. And this is why we're bringing in this reform perspective. And here we're focusing on the reform that introduced the seventh year only and is a lot narrower in spectrum. So it is slightly easier to isolate mechanisms, but also perhaps the effects of this reform are too minimal to be seen at uh, late life. So a little more background on uh, the on this uh, on the exposure assignment, and here we're going very far back in um, in uh, historical data sets because the reform was implemented in 1930s, starting from 1936. It influences birth cohorts as early as 1920. Um, it was implemented at a school district level, which roughly corresponds to church parishes. And here is our first assumption, because we will use the church parishes uh, as a proxy for district school level. The correspondence is about uh, 0.9 something, uh, but it's not perfect. Uh, this reform has not been previously studied. Uh, broadly uh, outside of the project I have been working on and a lot of work went into collecting the reform exposure data and this is a big innovation of this project is contributing another reform exposure to the toolbox of researchers and the team of researchers predominantly from Germany and Lund University in Sweden uh, went to 280 uh, historical archives to actually digitalized, uh, standardized exam catalogs. And from those catalogs, they were able to determine which of the two and a half thousand school parishes has had the extra year and for which cohorts. Uh, they have been able to reach a high data coverage with 98% of the school districts being covered. And uh, in our analyses that I will not go into detail of, um, the uh, this reform uh, resulted in an average increase of 0.7 years of education, which if you remember, it affected 70% of the population and uh, increased education by one year. So this also signifies that they have done a really good job at collecting this data exposure. Uh, and there have been a lot of tests and balancing checks uh, to find out the factors that we need to take into account in order to simulate pseudo-randomization. Uh, as our outcome, we used in this uh, study in Swedish National Patient Register and Cause of Death Register. Specifically, we used uh, uh, the Swedish National Hospitalization, uh, but here I say National Patient Register because we also did a lot of assessments of uh, our outcome. 
And based on population cohort studies, uh, the sensitivity of the National Patient Register is low. It's only uh, 47%, and the sensitivity of the cause of death register is even lower. The specificity is high. So the individuals who are identified as dementia cases using ICD codes truly have dementia, but we are missing a lot of cases. However, these data were not for the specific birth cohorts that we're using. And we also were interested in combining these data sources. So once you combine the data sources, uh, the sensitivity improves. And here I'm showing the figures uh, across educational levels. So for individuals with low education, the sensitivity of both of these data sources is about 74% and for those with high education, 69%, still with high specificity. So these numbers indicate that there is not a high evidence of differential misclassification by education. However, we're still missing about three individuals uh, out, of, out of 10 individuals who would have been identified uh, as demented or with dementia in the population-based studies where there is a detailed assessment of cognition and functional decline. So this is our outcome and now I'll again give you an overview of the uh, methods. Uh, for this study we use 16 birth cohorts and that is about 1.3 million individuals and here uh, we use parish of birth as a proxy for place of schooling and this is due to the historical nature of uh, the reform and that we're going so far back in uh, the past that we actually do not have any census data that would allow us to identify the place of residence at the time of schooling. So there's also an assumption of possible uh, migration or of limited migration. We have examined that assumption and about only 9% uh, possible misclassification of our exposure could happen due to migration. Um, then we also were interested in comparing and contrasting the causal effect of education to the observational effect in our specific data set. So we used the highest achieved education uh, and we uh, specified it in two different ways as the years of education or degree, highest achieved degree. Uh, our outcome was dementia. Uh, after the age of 65 in the data sources I have previously mentioned. And we use Cox survival models with 25 baseline hazards at the school district levels. And again, because our exposure is at the school district level or church parish level, we clustered our standard errors um, at that unit. So here are the findings from the main analysis and uh, the y-axis is hazard ratio with 95% confidence intervals. And uh, you can see that the confidence intervals are relatively broad and these, uh, this hazard ratio of about 1.01 indicates that this reform did not affect dementia in old age. Uh, because this reform has not been as extensively studied and there were a lot more assumptions, we have also done a lot of sensitivity analyses, uh, looking at uh, reforms that uh, uh, school districts that have, um, that have uh, both pre and post reform um, cohorts. Uh, we also looked at um, different educational tiers because this reform has affected only those with uh, primary schooling. Uh, or in that one specific type of primary schooling. So we looked only among those individuals. And since we're also using register data for our um, outcome, we adjusted for all-cause hospitalizations. We looked at mortality. We also looked at the possible effect of exposure misclassification. And in all of these models, we did not find any uh, effect of the reform on late life dementia. Uh, in contrasting this, we do find uh, observational association of uh, uh, years of education and dementia. And you can see that blue, uh, blue point there, uh, higher education, 
has been protective of dementia. So here we're replicating the observational studies in the meta-analysis. And that is true regardless of our specification. So here you can really see the contrast of the reform and the observational association. There are several possible interpretations of this finding. It could be that longer education caused by this specific schooling uh, reform did not have any substantial effect on the risk of dementia. But here it is really important to keep in mind that it is risk of dementia uh, on a hospital record or on a death record. So perhaps we are looking at individuals who are already at very severe or terminal stage and we are not able to adequately identify uh, the timing of onset and that the shift or the positive effect of education, it really occurs earlier in the disease progression. Uh, it is also possible that uh, and I said that this specific type of reform did not have a causal effect because this reform, if you remember, was very narrow in its uh, influence and it really prolonged education. So for this study in some way brings into question if prolonging education can reduce dementia. Perhaps it is the sustained effect through uh, midlife or the, for, uh, the effect of prolonged education through the later, uh, later life co uh, uh, cognitive stimulation through jobs or further educational attainment. So I was thinking about it in terms of you need to have an intervention and then also some maintenance of the effect throughout life in order to observe results. So this is... Uh, mm -hmm. so, yes. So, uh, one thing that we, we've been looking into quite a lot that um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, is whether there's any impact of the this primary school reform on mortality and selection. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, there is no effect uh, on mortality actually. So we have been looking at mortality. Uh, there is okay. I'll re-specify. There is no effect on all cause mortality. Uh, and there is a very minimal effect on uh, mortality prior to age 65. Um, and uh, we were not able to uh, create joint models uh, due to the uh, stratified baseline hazards design. If anybody has a smart way of how to do that, I'm open to doing that because uh, the best we came with was to actually look at it in separate models. Um, but yes, it did not affect mortality on average. Yeah, that would be the big concern. And if yeah. there's no impact on mortality, then you're not getting differential selection into your study. So it's not yeah. just you're missing people because this is the... Um, and I think also the one aspect, sorry for interrupting, but the one aspect to remember here about a differential selection is we are studying entire Swedish birth cohorts. Mm. So there isn't really much selection. So as far as selection goes, I was more concerned about a selection into the outcome data source, because if there was a high differential selection by education or the reform background, which there isn't, to receiving care, um, that could also uh, bias our results. But uh, again, it is national data on the other side with regards to outcome. There was no effect on all cause hospitalization. I also looked at counts of hospitalizations. Um, so we have been really trying to look at a lot of different possible selection mechanisms uh, in this, uh, in some way indirectly. But yeah, it's, it's quite tricky here, I agree. Yeah, it's interestingly consistent with some of the work that um, Emma Anderson has been mm -hmm. leading using multivariable MR. Um, there's no, sorry, Emma's just saying there's no option for me to put my mic on, but you mean total rather than direct effects. There are no adjustments here for other factors I can see, so it has to be a Right, so I think for me, uh, so here, uh, actually, Emma, if you remember the slide on I can try to go back. So I think we are now trying to rephrase this and by uh, direct effect, we mean not moderated via midlife socioeconomic uh, 
changes. Uh, because a lot of other reforms uh, that are studied all over the world, they actually most often influence also your later life educational achievements, as well as your midlife occupation and incomes. And this reform really just increased education. Um, so it is, that's what I, we mean by direct is just through education. But of course there's still, you know, it could be, uh, you could say it is a total effect of cognitive stimulation, not being in a workforce. So there are still possible indirect mechanisms there. Um, so that is what we are uh, thinking. So we will work on the wording. Um, yes, so this is, uh, I think this summarizes the second study and I have only one slide left. And my next slide is, um, the directions of our future work and the directions of our future work is looking also at the different uh, uh, timings of these reforms and there's another reform that in, in extended terms so you get uh, uh, terms of school year so there's a cumulative effect over the first full primary education so every year you get a one week extension so over the six or seven years of the primary schooling that amounts to about one more year of instruction, but it is in accumulation versus at one point in time. So that is a, uh, one of the plans uh, here that we want to look at. And we're also hoping in the future to look at the comprehensive schooling reform that had broader impacts um, to look at dementia. However, the cohorts are still relatively young. So at this point we could look at only early onset dementia. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank my uh, co-authors and funding agencies and open it up for more questions.